please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. GST collection can touch 1 lakh crore per month after the first quarter of the financial year, says Finance and Revenue Secretary Hasmukadia. He says no decision yet on the potential cut to excise duty on petrol and diesel. Let's listen in. Your target is touching at least that 1 lakh crore rupee mark, sir, as far as GST is concerned. That will help you meet your indirect tax target. Do you feel confident? Because, you know, we've been ambling between 86 odd thousand crores for the last two, three months. We're now edging closer, as I said, uh, for the month of February to about 90 odd thousand crores. Do you feel confident of being able to touch that 1 lakh crore rupee mark? We should be able to touch 1 lakh crore very soon. We should be able to. Maybe in a quarter, first quarter, soon after the first quarter, we should be touching uh, 1 lakh crore easily. Well, the government is very comfortable with the RBI's policy and stance. That's the word that's coming in from the Economic Affairs Secretary. Speaking at the India Business Leaders Award, he also says that bond yields could see a further reduction. Let's hear him out. Uh, the bond markets clearly seem to be buoyed by the fact that uh, it was a dovish policy that we saw uh, the governor Urjit Patel put forward yesterday. What's the outlook now as far as inflation is concerned and what's your own assessment of uh, your, uh, the fiscal consolidation roadmap because you've recalibrated your borrowing program giving people hope that you are going to stick to the fiscal consolidation roadmap? I don't think this is a dovish policy. It is a realistic policy. Uh, it's a realistic policy. It's not a, a dovish very, policy. And very realistic assessment of the inflation situation. Very realistic assessment of the growth position. And therefore, what uh, RBI has put out is something which we are very, very comfortable uh, with. Uh, you refer to the uh, bond program. What we uh, decided for the six months is actually not um, cutting short the program. We are evenly spreading the program in both the halves. So when we sometimes see that 48% of the borrowing program is what has been announced, if we take out the 25,000 crores by which we have actually reduced the program, mm. what we have announced is about 50% of the total. So there is no backloading, there is no front loading it's a very balanced equally paced kind of program and you saw the effect of that um, and we have also um, aligned our issuances to the market demand mm. so we have spread the bonds across the different uh, maturity spectrum so that the, the the issuances meeting the demand as well as an even paced out overall reduced program and also this inflation outlook which has been put out, growth good. I think we should have um, a reasonably priced, which is what is already you see. Yes. And maybe there is some further, further reduction in the bond yields going. Okay, well, all eyes will be on the bond yields today. This is after the Reserve Bank of India has hiked the FBI limit in G6. And... Uh, Lata is here this morning to tell us more about it. Lata, morning. Well, the increase is, uh, at the moment, uh, foreigners can buy up to 5% of total outstanding government securities. That's been increased to 55 for the current year and 6 year for FY20. Works out to 59,000 crore more of bonds that they can buy this year. Uh, that's the material year. Uh, next year, it will depend on the total amount of outstanding. Okay. But uh, the point is the market was widely expecting this on credit policy day itself. And there were some bond bulls who were expecting that it will actually go to 7%. So, uh, five and a half, uh, of course, a large swathe of people only expected 6%, knowing uh, RBI's conservatism on this issue. They don't want foreigners, they don't want Indians to be indebted to foreigners. This is a lesson from 1991, and we have never swerved from it. Uh, therefore, there could be a little bit of disappointment, but my sense is that uh, 59,000 crore is largely factored in. It will be a minor positive for, for bond yields today. Now, former RBI Deputy Governor H.R. Khan was questioned by the CBI on Friday. However, Mr. Khan has clarified to CNBC TV 18, and Lata is here to tell us what he had to say. Lata. Well, I did try to cajole him to speak to the channel, uh, but, uh, well, he refused. Uh, his point is that it was not really questioning as much as 
information seeking and uh, the uh, uh, CBI wanted to understand what was the 80-20 scheme, uh, okay. whether the RBI was aware that some would benefit and some wouldn't and uh, what was the necessity of doing it uh, in May 2014 when the government was changing. I understand the answers were something like uh, in all such policies to control uh, you know the foreign exchange flow to foreign exchange outflow. Some people do gain and some people you know it's like rationing. Those who have the stuff uh, generally make money as well. The uh, issue of uh, uh, liberalizing it to include star trading houses uh, allowing import through star, star trading houses in 2014, which is what everyone is concentrating on, was a discussion that started well before, according to uh, RBI sources and Mr. Khan. And it was only, it just happened to be signed on that uh, particular day. Uh, there was nothing, it was nothing like it was rushed. It was well debated uh, between government and RBI. Uh, that, that primarily an information seeking and interview. Okay, all right, Lata. Thanks uh, very much for that. But uh, moving on now, we have it. Uh, we have the latest in the PNB case. Non-bailable warrants were issued by the CBI against Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi. Utkarsh Chaturvedi has more on this. Uh, so uh, CBI had already moved court uh, uh, a few weeks back rega regarding uh, the issuance of non-bailable warrant against Nirav Modi and Mehul Choksi. Uh, yesterday, that court has finally gone ahead and issued uh, the non-bailable warrant. Now, why is it uh, the NBW important? Uh, the NBW is important because uh, to issue a red corner notice and going ahead with the extradition process, uh, it becomes important that the, you need to, uh, the, the court needs to issue a non-bailable warrant. And this is when you know, the whole process of extradition can start. Now what we're picking up uh, is uh, that the government has an idea of uh, where Nira Modi is. Uh, in fact, uh, in an answer uh, to Rajya Sabha, the, minister, uh, the external affairs minister wrote that uh, it is Hong Hong Kong, where uh, they believe that Nira Modi is, so they will start the extradition process soon. So clearly, it's more of a procedural development, given the fact that Nira Modi and Mehul Choksi both are not in the country, uh, but important for the extradition process to start. Okay, all right, Utkash, thanks so much for joining in, giving us those details. Well, ahead of the assembly polls, scheduled to be held on the 12th of May in Karnataka, the BJP has released its first list of candidates late last night, I think. Uh, and uh, this time around, uh, there were notable names like Yadurapa, who is uh, in the list. We have Rukmini, Rukmini Rao, who joins us with all those details. Rukmini, good morning. Who are the notable names? And any surprise uh, this time around? Morning, Nigel. Morning. In a late last night's release, in fact, uh, the BJP has gone ahead and released a list of 72 candidates that it... Uh, Decide, that it has decided to uh, field in Karnataka. In fact, the notable names being that of the CM candidate of BJP, uh, Mr. Yadurapa, who will be contesting from the tried and tested constituency where, where he has, um, you know, stood uh, for n number of times uh, from Shikaripura. Even uh, the party veterans like Ishwarapa and uh, Jagdish Shetar will be contesting from uh, Shimoga and uh, Hubli Dharwad Central, respectively. But uh, very importantly, a lot of sitting MLAs of Bangalore City have been given tickets. Uh, they have been, uh, you know, asked to kind of contest again from their respective constituency. There's hardly any change in the constituency of the sitting MLAs who are contesting from Bangalore. Apart from that, of course, uh, tainted uh, Bellari mining baron uh, Janathan Reddy's aide, Sira Mulu, who was, uh, you know, thought that would be contesting around Bellari has not been given a ticket from Bellari, but from Molkal Muru. Uh, in fact, uh, that is where he will be contesting from. But still, uh, there are about 152 other candidates whose name uh, BJP will perhaps release over the course of uh, this week. We guess we'll have to wait and watch who the other people from BJP are who will be contesting this time around. Back to you. Well, before we move on, let's take a quick check on the Asian market. Let's see how they are doing. Remember, the cost was holding with a gain of around two tenths of a percent when we started off the show. Well, it's uh, holding in the green. The Shanghai market's as flat as can be, and the Hang Seng is sitting with a gain of close to around six tenths of a percent. When we started off the show, the SGX Nifty was telling us that, in fact, we'd like to see a cut of around 30 points. So let's see what the la latest uh, updates are from there. It's still indicating that we're likely to see a cut of around 30 points. Remember the US markets, it took a sharp cut in Friday's training session, but interesting to see what the Dow Jones futures as well are doing in indicate, uh, indications were that we could see a bit of a bounce 
uh, in today's trading session in terms of the U.S. markets. But uh, coming back home then, Lemon Tree Hotels, that's all said to make its debut today. The 1,000 crew order public issue was subscribed a little over one times in the past week. Manglam's here to tell us uh, what all those details. Good morning, Manglam. Good morning, Nigel. So uh, for Lemon Tree, you know, a weak listing is expected. Tell you why. Because it is a good brand, good inventory, the business is good. The value that was on offer as far as the IPO is concerned was quite a lot. So it was very expensive versus peers. And that is something that uh, the subscribers also kept an eye on. So apart from the qualified institutional buyers, the institutions who oversubscribed this issue by about 3.9 times, there was very little appetite for the overall offer. The HNIs as well as the retail investors did not even subscribe to more than 15%. 0.12% of the offer made to them. So this 1,000 crore IPO, which is uh, an issue, uh, which came at an issue price of 56 per share, is actually an uh, offer for sale by, by non-promoters, Maplewood Investments, as well as uh, the PEs. So let's take a look at the pros and the cons of the company. So the pros are it's a leading brand in the mid-price segment. The industry dynamics are strong. Remember the Indian hotels management saying that occupancy for the industry is likely to grow from 62 to 64 percent. In that environment, this company does 75 percent percent occupancy and with higher EBITDA margins than most of its peers barring uh, Kamath hotels as well. Now uh, let's take a look at what's not good. The, the not good part is the fact that the IPO is a complete offer for sale so no much mon not much money in fact no money going in back to the company and they are growing so the capex going forward is likely to hurt their leverage as well as of nine months FY18 they had 900 crores of debt on their books and at 75 percent occupancy as well the company turned positive a net profit positive only in FY18 after five years. So we need to know what kind of operating leverage that they have. The promoters to own just about 31.1% stake in the company. All of this, valuations, they come at 40 times FY18 EV to EBITDA. That compares with sub-10 for Kamath, uh, EIH Associated, Royal Orchid and Indian Hotels trading anywhere between 27 to 32 times. And if you take a look at the listing scenario at 56 rupees, it would trade at a market cap of 4,400 crore rupees and 40 times EV to EBITDA. The others on the upper and the lower end are up for you on your screen. Okay, um, and Manglam, what about the FNO space? Well, the FNO space, ekta, and nothing really uh, that, that would suggest that the needle is going to move either way because if you take a look at the Friday's trading session, yes, the FIS sold in the cash market, a lot of cash money pumped in by the DIS, but in the next futures, there was a short sell or close to around 200 crores by the foreign institutional investors. They're still about 80% uh, a short on the index futures, the FIS. So in any significant up move may perhaps result in some short covering, but seems like at the higher levels, we are seeing a fair amount of selling. That's what the Nifty in uh, futures uh, premium also indicated. There was some protection buying the FIS, bought about 941 crores in index options, and that contained two elements. One, there was some long put addition, and secondly, there was some uh, short covering in index calls at the 10,200 level. So 10,300 put that one added close to around six and a half lakh shares a premium of close to around 100 rupees indicating that 10,200 is a mark that the bulls believe they can protect 10,200 call on the other hand saw some shots running for cover at a premium of 227 so more than 10,350 10,400 is a mark that we'll be watching out for jet airways that stock entered the fno ban gmr infra and jubilant food those stocks were buzzing on friday they saw some long positions being added there Okay, all right, Manglam, thanks so much for that. Well, hopping across to Manisha Gupta, she's joining in with all the updates from the commodity markets. Hi, Manisha, good morning. Hi, good morning. Let's start with the crude oil prices, where we have seen some stability return, and after this nearly 2% decline on Friday, well, uh, you have seen an increase in the U.S. drilling activity by nearly 11. The total number now stands at 808 oil rigs. It also has to do with the intensification of trade disputes between U.S. and China. That seems to be weighing in. But the major cues, of course, would come in from the U.S. dollar. That one is off its one-month highs. Uh, the U.S. job data on Friday was lower than expected. Markets were working at 139,000. You got 103,000 job growth in the month of March, and that clearly weighs on. But having said that, uh, there is so much to watch out in the global markets. The U.S.-China discussion for one. And the other space really is going to be the Iran currency, which has declined 5.5% on Sunday. Uh, it's a new record low that we are trading in Asia with. There are concerns of crippling sanctions returning from U.S. on Iran. So that is another thing that would impact food oil prices and the whole currency space as well. 